us tonight, and I want to start at uh, 2 Timothy, uh, no, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, chapter 3, if you would. 2 Peter, chapter number 3. And as I said a moment ago, and I want to say it now, I, I grew up in church, and I, I grew up with the same expectation that I have tonight. I, I believe, and I'll then, and I believe as firmly now, that Jesus is coming again. Now, that's what I want to talk about. When my brother went off in the Marines when I was seven years old, I thought I'll never see my brother again because Jesus is going to come back before he gets out of the Marines. That was 1984. 1984, a man wrote a book. In, in 88, he wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. I don't know if you all know this or not, but he didn't come back in 1988. But a lot of God's people, a lot of Christian people went out and, and uh, they, they were convinced that it was going to happen. I read stories where people put their dogs to sleep because they didn't want the dog to endure the tribulation period and so forth. Well, the man missed it, but 1992 came around and he wrote a book entitled 92 Reasons Why the Lord is Coming Back in 1992. And it didn't happen. Does that mean he's not returning? He is coming again. He, so, he told us when he left, he said, Occupy till I come. That word occupy means go in business for him. It means make his business your business. It means to be busy. The Bible says when the son of man cometh, will he find faith on earth? The way we communicate the gospel in Romans chapter one is from faith to faith. Um, I thank God when I can sit up here and I can hear my children Testify for the Lord. When I can hear your children testify for the Lord. When I can hear you testify for the Lord. Because it's witness to the fact that the gospel is carried from faith to faith. And that's how this thing works. That's how it works. Uh, I, I became a teenager. And... Um, God began to work in my heart. I remember we were down here at the restaurant one day, one afternoon, one evening after service, and me and uh, Adam Fields were down there, my cousin, and we were up to no good. And uh, if you could believe that or not, we were carrying on. And and uh, there was a uh, one of the uh, waitresses or workers down there. I guess she was near our age, and we were kind of showing off her a little bit. I know you wouldn't believe that, but and uh, she was right there by us, and uh, and Bob walked up behind me and. And uh, he said, uh, he said, I don't know why he did it, I, I guess because he's Bob Fields, but he walked up behind me and he said, he said, here's the next preacher of the Fields family. And I'm thinking, that's not exactly what I was wanting to per per portray myself as to this young lady here. And that wasn't exactly what I had in my, in my mind. But, uh, but the truth of the matter is God knew what he was doing. But honestly, I never imagined that I would ever preach or ever do anything as far as serving the Lord because I was certain that by the time I became of that age that the Lord would return. And that's all I'd ever heard. And tonight, I'm just a couple years shy of turning 50. And I never imagined that we'd be here. The year 1999 came around and Y2K. Y'all remember that? I preached at a little church, a church camp, and they had water stored up and they had everything ready for the next day because that imminent doom. All the computers were going to shut down. Everything was going to stop. Y'all remember that? And I had in my pocket, just in case, I figured, well, there's no gamble here. Uh, I can't lose. If the world comes to an end, I don't have to worry. I had an engagement ring in my pocket. And uh, I had Jessica with me and Andrew Steers were, was with us to chaperone, you know, to keep us out of trouble. And I preached that night and I intended Y2K. If, if it didn't all end, I intended to go ahead and get married and live my life. 
And that night I asked Jessica to marry me. A year or so later, we were married. A few months later, nine months later. And uh, God's allowed us to be married for 20 plus years. I've been here at this church for 20 plus years. I've seen numerous people come and go, go to heaven. I see you folks here tonight. I see these young people. Now I have children that are ready to begin life outside of our home. And I'm so thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm glad Matt testified twice tonight because it's wor he's worthy. Yeah. Amen. Especially, especially when your testimony consists of thanking God for how good he is. Yeah. I've never one time thought I deserved to stand in the pulpit. I know it's all because of God's grace. But I'm, I want to, tonight, I, I, I want to show you something from the Word of God. I, I'm not up here intending to just play on your heartstrings. I want to show you something tonight. I want to encourage you. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 1, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, thank God, there's a but after verse 7. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. Now look at verse 9. Following that statement. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But is long suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. Now again look at verse 10. But. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Someday this world is going to be burned up. It's going to be consumed by the fire of God, the judgment of God. This world, there's an increasing element. The Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I'm not going to stand up here tonight and tell you that the world's getting better. I don't believe that. I, I, I believe that there's, but I'm not going to tell you that the world, that it's never been this bad before either. Because I've studied enough and I've looked at it enough and down through the annals of history, I've seen that there's, there have been some mighty wicked men in this world and there have been some mighty evil times that have transpired in this world. And then I think of, as what Matt was saying in his testimony, I think of how the effect of the gospel has been on this land we call America. And how good God has been to us. And the truth of the matter is, if you study it, you'll find very little similarity throughout all of history to a nation that has been blessed like our nation and has the freedom that we have. Amen. We are so incredibly blessed in this nation. The goodness of God is so evident. And even now, even in this day and time in which we live, whenever so many people in our nation have uh, taken a, an anti-God, anti-Bible stand, we still honestly, 
uh, we still have a whole lot more of us than you, than you and I realize. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of wonderful churches in this country. There's a lot of good churches, and there's a lot of godly people, and there's a lot of old-fashioned people that love the Word of God and love God and love to get together. And, and, and it might be a gathering like this of a, of a few people. It could be a gathering, a great big gathering of hundreds of people. I don't know. But the truth of the matter is, there's still a, lot, there's still a great remnant of people in this country that love God and love the Word of God and love to gather and preach and hear the preaching of the word of God and hear the singing of the word of God of God's word and, and praising God and glorifying his name. There's a lot of people in this country still going soul winning. There's a lot of people that go out in this nation and go door to door and run bus routes and knock on doors. And it's an incredible thing tonight that God is still working. Hey, God's not tired, and the gospel's not gotten rusty, and God doesn't look down like we look up and say, well, God, I reckon it's all over now. God looks down and says, you know what? One day is with the Lord, it's a thousand years, and I believe tonight that God is looking down at us and saying, why aren't we busy? Why do we want to quit? Why are we so, so, uh, so much demanding the end whenever God says, you know what, maybe, I've got, maybe there's more work I want to be done. Maybe, maybe, maybe there are more people I want to be reached. God said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord's not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to usward. Isn't that something that he says that? We're already saved. Why do we need him to be long-suffering? Because God is long-suffering to usward because he's given us a job to do. He's given us a command. He's given us a commission. He's given us the responsibility to tell others about him. It's our job. It's our duty. It's our responsibility to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. He said when he went away, ye shall be my witnesses. He said, go ye into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And he said, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Hey, listen, God's looking for some people that are looking for him. But while we're looking, we're busy. If my, if my dad gave me a job, I didn't, we didn't have, dad didn't care, we didn't, I grew up in a day, it's hard to believe, but I grew up in a day you didn't have cell phones. But if God, if dad gave me a job to do and said, I'll be back home in a little bit, I didn't call him up and say, dad, you about back? I'm waiting to decide whether or not I should do this job or not. I want to know if you're coming home today. No, I, the fact that he let, went away and told me to get the job done before I get back meant that I better not play around. I better not, I better not wait around. I don't know when he's coming back, but I do know one thing. He gave me a job to do, and it's not my job to sit around and idle the time away wondering if today's the day or tomorrow's the day or maybe he's going to be back this afternoon. The, my duty, my responsibility was to get the job done. I'm afraid that far too often we as Christians is set by idly waiting and wondering and thinking, well, it must be all over. Every little event we use as an excuse to signal us to think that, you know what, this is it. It's all over. I've heard preachers my whole life say, as this uh, great age of grace comes to a close, who said Yes, it's true, it, it is true, and, 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 and we're one day closer to the Lord's return than we were yesterday. But the truth of the matter is, I, I don't know when he's coming. I, I, I do know this, that I don't need to allow that to be an excuse to keep me from occupying till he comes. I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I had, I've had to fight this my whole life, the idea, and now my life, I reckon, is about halfway over, and guess what, I'm still here. And you're still here. And I can't promise you young people tonight that what you won't stand someday when you're 40 or 50 or 60 years old, I can't promise you tonight that you, that you won't still be dealing with the duty of the Great Commission and the responsibility. I don't want you to just say, oh, well, I don't have to worry about it. I'll never get there. Because I thought that my whole life. And now I'm here. 
And the responsibility is on my shoulders tonight, and it's on your shoulders. It's on the shoulders of God's people. We're, we're, the, 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 the job title hasn't changed. The responsibility hasn't changed. We're supposed, still supposed to. The only hope for this world is you and I as God's people. The only hope for the drug addict tonight. The only hope, the only hope for that person that's down and out tonight and their life is almost destroyed. The only hope for them is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only hope for the people stooped in false religion is you and I who know Jesus. The only hope for them is for us to witness to them of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We're the only answer they have. Now tonight we're supposed to be in Hosea. So I want you to turn to Hosea chapter number 2 and I want you to see something there. One of the things that I love about the prophets of God. One of the things I love about the preaching of the prophets of God is God demonstrated his heart through the prophets. The prophets of God, they weren't pre preaching their message. They were like us. I imagine, or Brother Cameron, the prophets of God would just as soon sometimes been fishing. They had just they, they they had things to take care of. They had duties to take care of. And, but they but God called them. We know that Elisha was plowing with the uh, how many yoke of oxen and and uh, what was it, twelve or twenty four. 12 yoke of oxen and he went and burned them up and got rid of them you know why he done that because he wasn't planning to go back peter was a fisherman they had families they had they had jobs uh uh, uh the, the the different ones uh some were herdmen but god said to him i got a job for you jonah we know tried to run from god's call but he couldn't jonah said i don't want you to save nineveh God, I don't want you to save Nineveh. I know what you'll do, God. I know you're merciful. I know your kindness, God. And I hate those people. And I don't want them to be saved. I don't want them to repent. Isn't that something? And he tried to run from it. But he couldn't. Tonight, are you running from God's call on your life? I, 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 tonight, tonight, are we saying, God, you know what? I don't think it applies to me. I don't think it matters, God. I don't think there's any time. I don't think I need to worry about it. You know what? Maybe you do. Maybe we do tonight. Maybe we do need to take this thing serious and say, you know what? I, I do need to get serious about being a witness for God. I do need to get serious about God's calling on my life and, and, and preaching God's word and teaching God's word. And I, I believe that all of God's people are called to minister his word. Amen. We're not, you're not all, uh, uh, God's not calling any women to pastor churches or anything like that. Amen. Hey, but listen, God, God is looking at his people saying, hey, I give you my word. I want you to give it to somebody else. I want you to minister my word to of the people and I want you to labor in the word and minister to them tonight what I'm trying to tell you is that I don't think we have to accept the fatalist idea and just sit on the sideline and watch the devil's crowd run amok I really don't I really don't think that we have to let Hollywood have the next generation of young people I don't think that we have to let the next generation of young people grow up in, in, in a vile and filthy environment and just throw our hands up and say, go ahead, devil, you can have them because there's no time, there's no use in it. I think that's some of what happened to my generation. I think we got lackadaisical. I think we got lazy and we kind of just sat back instead of contending for the faith. We just kind of sat back thinking, well, we won't be here much longer. We kind of took the gap pedal off the accelerator. You know what drives me crazy is watching somebody that's got a really good car and they drive really slow. Now, I don't always drive really fast, but I, I, you know what I mean? But when, so, but, but when someone is in front of me and they're making a turn and they've got a car that's got an accelerator on it and I know it's got an engine under the hood and I know that car, I mean, and, 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 and I'll put it behind someone, they're driving a Hummer, you know what I mean? And they, they, they made a turn and it took about five minutes to delicately, and I'm thinking, man, I know, I know that that vehicle can handle that little pothole right there. Just get it off the road, man. Don't wait forever. Hey, when we're driving a, a vehicle with an engine like the guy gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't think we ought to be worried about burning it out. I don't think we ought to be worried about, about it wearing out, amen? 
I like uh, the old story. I heard uh, uh, brother, uh, Jeff Fugit tell one time of his daddy. His daddy died just before he turned 50 years of age. He developed a brain tumor, cancer, and he died at a young age. Now his son pastors a church in Kentucky, a, a great soul winning church down there. But his daddy, Brother Fugit, pastored over in the mountains of Hazard, Kentucky. And by the way, the work that God started with him is still going on. Over in the mountains of Hazard. Y'all know Hazard, Kentucky. I don't have to explain that to you. They had a thousand people in their church on some occasions in Hazard, Kentucky, in the mountains. Said one time an old preacher came up to his dad and said, Sam, you're going to wear out. He said, you're going to wear yourself out. And he said, I'd rather wear out for God than rust out. The old devil's always trying to tell us to slow down, to calm down. It'll all be old. Don't have to worry about it. I want to show you something tonight, if I could. Hosea chapter 2, verse number 1 says, Say ye unto your brethren, am I? And to your sisters, who am I? These two people... Am I and who am I? I, I, I want to make sure I give, you, give them to you the right way and what their names mean. Uh, but uh, this am I means a people, a, a, a troop or a, a flock. And, and God is, you, the prophet Joel, uh, Hosea here is speaking affectionately to the remnant of God's people in Israel, the, the, the troop. The, the, the people that know God, and there was always a remnant in Israel. And he says to Am I? He says, I want you to say to your uh, to your uh, to your brother, and then to Ruama, uh, I want you to say to your sisters. The name Ruama means to love and to show mercy. He says to those who are a troop among the people of God, and he says to those who know the mercy of God, Ruama. To, that know the, the, the tender mercies of God, that know His kindness. He said, I want you to be my witness to your people. He said, I want you to stand up for me. You know, that's what David tried to do, was, was to be a witness for God to his people. And that's why he lived the life that he lived. And, and, and even though he had sinned and failed, he was like all the rest of us. But David had a heart for God. That's why Elijah stood and preached. That's why the prophets of old, they were saying to their people, that's why Elijah stood on the mountain and, and stood before the prophets of Baal and prayed. And he said to Israel, how long halt ye between two opinions? That's why Isaiah preached of God's goodness and his mercy. And he's saying to am I, the troop, the remnant, the, 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 uh, the confederate ones that believe in God. He said, you speak to your brother. And he's saying to who am I? He said, those of you that know God's goodness and go, know God's mercy. He said, I want you to plead with your mother plead with Israel plead with your nation plead for she is not my wife neither I her husband let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. He, God is saying there he said I've given her a bill of divorcement he said but I'm not giving up on her he said I want you to plead with her he said lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And he said, I will not have mercy upon her children for they be the children of whoredoms. God's saying, he said, this is, this is what I want you to say. He said, I want you to let them know that I'm weary of it. He says, for their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil, my drink. Now look at verse number six. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up the way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. Verse number seven, and she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. You know, God has an incredible way of getting the job done. And God uses us to get the job done. I don't believe that God will save you against your will, but I believe that God can make you willing. 
I, I'm, I, I believe that God can deal with a person when they've heard the gospel. And, and listen, and, and, and the, the light of the glorious gospel begins to shine. And the Bible says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You say, well, I don't want to make it offensive. God, give us some preachers once again that will stand in the pulpit and persuade men and will reach out to people so that when people come to church, they walk away and say, you know what? I feel like that man was preaching to me. I feel like he was preaching to me. Boy, he stepped on my toes. Hey, that's called a God-called preacher. That's what God needs tonight is some men who will stand up and persuade others. But also outside the pulpit, we need to persuade people. So I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt them. What are you going to do? Offend them to third hell, fourth hell, fifth hell? Are you going to cause them to be any more backslidden? Yes, we need to pray for people, but we also need to persuade them and say, you know what you need to do? You need to get right with God. You need to, you need to get your heart right. Hey, it, 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 listen, this is not a time to be playing around. This is not a time to be courting the world. This is not a time for God's people to be following after the harlot. Hey, this is a time for God's people to get in church and get in the Bible and get to know God and pray, brother, listen, because it is bad. And you think it's bad in our generation. Wait till the next generation comes along. Unless some of God's people who are know God's mercy and those who are a troop who are soldiers for God will stand up and say to Christianity, hey, we're not right. We're following after the pattern of Israel. We're, we, we've, uh, we've, we're committing harlotry with the world and our churches. We're, we're not separated like we ought to be. So he says here, therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Can you imagine tonight if God pulled his mercy away from us? You know, Matt said in his testimony, you know why America is blessed? Because America has been blessed of God. That's why. In America tonight, all, all God has to do is say, Pull his hand off. And this country is going to know hardship and, and misery unlike anything else tonight. It's not it, the only thing that keeps this nation going is the blessing and the goodness of God. And we do nothing to earn his blessing or his goodness. We do everything to earn his wrath and to cause God to bring down judgment upon our nation. And our nation, by and large, it seems like defies God. Even our Christians are lukewarm. He said, I would that you were hot or cold. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. The average Christian that can take it or leave it. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be, I'll be at church if nothing comes up. I read my Bible every once in a while. God, help us not to be lukewarm. Help us to be hot or cold. Amen. Amen. Look what he said. He said, now, verse number 10, now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. Now look what he said. I also will cause all her mirth to cease. Huh? Her free feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and her solemn feasts. That word mirth means joy and happiness. Boy, we're having a good time, aren't we? I mean, that's what it's all about, is having a good time. No, it's not. God says, what if I take the good time away? Yeah. I tell you tonight, God could change things real fast. He said, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, these are my reward that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense wherein she burned incense to them and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels and she went after her lovers and forgot me. Seems to me like we're forgetting God in our nation. Saith the Lord. Now look at this. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I love this. God saying to the nation of Israel, he said, behold, I will allure her. And bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Can I tell you tonight, and we don't realize this, we don't think about it very much, but when God sent John the Baptist on the scene, John preached in the wilderness. 
And he preached and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and listen, and the sins of his nation, the sins of his people, and the people, the Bible says, the people went out to hear John preach, and they, they came to hear him preach, and they were baptized of John in the wilderness, and John introduced his disciples to Jesus. Hey, and listen, can I tell you something? That there was revival in the land of Israel, whether we want to realize it or not, through the preaching of John the Baptist. And hey, I reckon Jesus did some pretty good preaching too, amen. And the people followed him and they came to see the miracles and to hear the message. And the Bible says the common people heard him gladly. And Jesus chose out of that group 12 disciples. And God used those men, Jesus used those men to establish what we are tonight. The Bible says salvation is of the Jews. The Jewish people, the nation of Israel, for many years de 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 denied God and defied God. But God said, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to I'm not going to walk away from you. Hey, God said, I love you and I'm going to send my son and he's going to come and he's going to die for your sins. Just like I said he would. And God pulled together from that group a remnant of believers. And through that group, God started a church. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but the church is simply a continuation of what God had always been doing in Israel. Just got a new name and some new definition and some new features, but tonight we're supposed to do just like they did in the Old Testament. We sing the songs of David and we, we study the stories, amen, and we're just a continuation of what God did the ministry of John the Baptist and his son Jesus, most of course Jesus preeminently, but John as the forerunner of Jesus and then Jesus as the preacher and as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and is what Jesus did on Calvary. He went away and his disciples said, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons with he's putting his own power. He said, Go thou and preach. He said, I got a job for you to do. The job hasn't changed. But we're just like they are. God, is this it? What about today? How about now? Surely in my generation, God, let me off the hook because I'm tired and I don't want to do it. But God, I just don't think you can do it anymore. Maybe we think the gospel has lost its power. Maybe we think that there's no answer. Maybe we just think that since we give up, God gives up. Or is it possible that God could still do some great things? Is it possible that we could still have revival? Every preacher I've ever heard just about says there's no hope. We can't have revival anymore. Is God not God? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land. I missed some there. I know you can look it up. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Someone will say that verse doesn't apply to us. Oh, are you not God's people? Do we not belong to him? Have we not been purchased by the blood of his son? Are we not his? Is our land not in need of healing? Our world is in desperate situation. You know, the only hope for this world is us. We're the answer for this world. He said this. He said, I will give her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Can, can, you, imagine, can you imagine James and his little band of Jews in Jerusalem having church together? Can, can, I, can I ask you tonight to envision the little early days of the New Testament church when there was scattered among all those Jewish believers, a few Gentiles? And James, can, can I tell you tonight, the Apostle Paul said, for I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. That word ready is a word that meant alacrity. He said, I can't wait to preach it. You couldn't keep Paul down. You couldn't make him rest. They say, Paul, we got to sleep a little bit. He said, I know it, but I don't want to. He said, I got to preach somewhere. He said, I, there's, play, there's people that need to hear this. He said, I never heard this. He said, I sat uh, six days a week, 10 hours a day, at the, 12 hours a day at the feet of Gamaliel. And I was a wicked, vile man. And I had no hope. But one day I met Jesus and I want other people to know him. Amen. 
Paul believed that God could do great things through the gospel. But somehow or another, we've lost that. Our churches today are just holding on, holding the fort. He said, occupy till I come. We need to, we need to have a stirring in our hearts, a reviving in our souls. Uh, quit talking about the way it used to be. These young people, this generation, young people in Christianity today need something more than what it used to be. You all need to dream. You all need to believe God. You need to have a vision for what God can do. Grandma and grandpa, we need to, uh, you, almost uh, not we, right? You, oh, you all, uh, you all grandmas and grandpas, amen. And me someday, we need to believe that God can do great things. We need to believe that there's a possibility that our children and grandchildren might grow up and die and grow old. And somebody's going to have to preach the gospel. Somebody's going to have to minister. I'm not trying to let you off the hook tonight. I'm not trying to let myself off the hook. I, 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 need, I need stirring. Amen. And you need stirring. And God's people and God's church needs a stirring. The gospel hasn't lost its power. It's, now look at this. In verse 16, And it shall be, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai, and thou shalt call me no more Balai. I love that. That word Ishai means a good husband. A loving husband. You know, there's a difference between a husband and a good husband. Yeah. Ladies, amen right there. Amen. Uh, a, a loving, uh, a, a, a man that walks around saying, I'm the man around here. I'm in charge here. If you got to say that all the time, you know, something wrong. But, but if you'll be the man, and if you'll love your family and love your wife and love your children, then there's a reverence. There's a respect. God doesn't demand anybody, but he said to Israel, he said, rather than being my servants and having a servant-master relationship, he said, I'm, he said We're, I'm gonna be a loving husband and you're gonna want to serve me and you're gonna want to honor me because I love you. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. I, 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 I believe as men, I believe as men, we ought to have it as our goal to love our families more and more and make our marriages stronger and stronger. Amen. I, I, don't, I always get in trouble when I say this, but I'm not looking for a man cave to hide. And if anybody needs one, I do. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I remember one time I got so angry driving home. I seen a bar up here that said halfway home. Honestly, I wanted to burn the place down. That's not halfway home. Go home and love your family. You need to stop and booze it up on the way home so you can gear up for them. Go love your wife. Go love your children. Amen. That's what the Lord said here. He said, you'll no longer call me, uh, by that name, he said, uh, and in that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them lie down safely. Now you can say, and I agree, that he's talking there about the millennial reign, but one day is with the Lord as a thousand, and a thousand is one day. You'll have to forgive the Lord. He got excited about the future. You know, the Lord has never dismayed the future. He's never fretted tomorrow. I know who holds tomorrow, amen? God's not nervous. He's not up in heaven saying, well, I wonder what's going to happen. You know why we do that? Because we don't really believe in him like we should. Amen? We ought to be as worried tonight as God is. We ought to be as fearful tonight as God is. And that will encourage you, Amen? Listen, he said, I will betroth thee unto me forever. In the Old Testament, they knew nothing about everlasting life, but God told them about it. He said, you'll be mine forever. He said, I'm going to make a covenant with you through my son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. No man or woman stands at the marriage altar and says, well... 
I'm gonna try this out for a while. So I'm gonna put you on the nine month plan, see how we do, and then I'll decide afterwards, probationary period. You'd run from that person. It's till death do us part. And God said, I will betroth thee to me forever. Look what he said here. He said, I will betroth even, I even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. Thou shalt know the Lord. Isn't that something? He says, he says, you're going to have intimate knowledge of me. You know, you can't know God except through Jesus. But through Christ and through the word, you know what? We get to know God. Tonight, if you want to know God, you can know him. You can have a relationship with him. You know, I love to see I love to see a church full of people that know God. And know his goodness and know his mercy and know his answers to prayer. And we can come to church together and open our hymn book up. And we know the God we sing about. And we know the God we preach about. And we know the God we tell others about. We know him. Amen. To know him. He said, you shall know God. The Bible says, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will hear, saith the Lord. And I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. Isn't that something? Jesus said, he said, when I go away, he said, you can pray directly to the Father now. He said, isn't that something? That we can talk to God and God, we hear from him. Amen. We have his word. You know, you don't need anybody to preach to you. You can hear the word of God yourself. God's giving you his word. You can hear from heaven every day if you want to. And heaven can hear from you as often as you want heaven to hear from you. Amen. Isn't that something? We have access to the throne of grace. And he says, come boldly that you might find grace to help in time of need. You don't have to call the priest up. The Old Testament Jews, they, couldn't, they didn't understand that. They didn't have access to the Holy of Holies, but we do. Amen. We can go to God anytime. The Bible says, and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Remember that name in the first chapter? I'm almost done. Remember that name Jezreel? It meant scattered people. But that name Jezreel has two meanings. It can be used two ways. In one way, it means scattered. But in the other way, it means sowed. Now, Matt will tell you that I'm telling you the truth. When, our, when we moved to the farm, my dad wanted to plant corn everywhere. And then he wanted to work. And he, and he had corn growing and... Uh, he didn't know that, you know, farmers have lots of kids and he had Matt and then me 10 years later. So I was just a little runt. I couldn't do anything. And so Matt told me that, uh, you know, he would go through the field and put the corn in the field. And then he said, get to the end of the field and the corn would never run out, you know, and I got to plant more corn. So he just throws some up in the woods. And there was corn growing in the creeks and corn growing everywhere. <laughs> and uh, y'all remember that. Broke the hoe handles. How many had, dad told him he was going to put metal hoe handles in if he kept breaking them? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, and I, I hid in the car when I was eight years old in the heat of the summer for two hours because I didn't want to heal potatoes one time. And they were, when I hid in the car, I almost died. We're lazy boys. We, we, we grew out of it, but far, farming... Yeah, <laughs> mowing the corn. It, it takes a lot of work, but God said here, he said, I'm going to scatter you. He said, but really what I'm doing is sowing you. Amen. I'm sowing. God said, I'm going to scatter you. He said, but I'm going to sow you. He said, and I'm going to have a crop. He said, someday I'm going to reap the harvest. Jesus was the first fruits. And afterwards, the harvest. Can I tell you something? The devil has always thought he's going to win, but he loses. Because God is greater than him. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Can I tell you that God's right on time? And so what God did, now look here, he says, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Can I tell you that that applies to both Jew and Gentiles? Because there was a time when God said to Israel, you're not my people anymore. That Romans chapter 11 says he hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon them all. 
He said, if the, he said, if the putting away of them, he said, you come and he said, if that's good, he said, how much more when I gather them back together again? Amen. Look at Romans chapter eight, verse number, no, Acts chapter eight, verse number one. Then we're done tonight. I'm done. It's 804. I want you to see Acts chapter eight, verse number one. God said, I'll scatter you. Look at chapter 1 just for a minute of Acts. Verse number 8. Remember this, Acts 1, 8. Then we're going to go to Acts 8, 1. Look at 1, 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in where? Jerusalem. And in where? Judea. And in where? Samaria. And into the uttermost part of the earth. Now look at chapter 8, verse number 1. And Saul, who was Saul, later on Paul, the man God used to organize these churches. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a what? A great persecution against the what? Church, which was composed of who? Believers, primarily Jews and a few Gentiles, which was where? Jerusalem. And they were all what? Scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and where? Isn't that a coincidence? Just like God said it was going to happen. They were all hunkered down at Jerusalem saying, boy, ain't this wonderful? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Testifying. And that there were some difficulties, but they were, everything was okay. But God said, ah, oh, that's not what I said to do. Amen. I'm going to scatter to you. Now look at this. Look at this. This is incredible. Except the apostles. They, they stayed around and kept things going. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and great mate, great made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. And then Philip went down to the city of where? Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Can I tell you that there wasn't a more wicked? Samaria was the city founded and built up by Ahab and Jezebel. I mean, nobody, nobody could touch Samaria. But Philip said, I'm going to go to Samaria and preach. And they said, are you out of your mind? You can't preach Jesus in Samaria. Those people are reprobates. You can't win them. And it says that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and they that were lame uh, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Oh, if you'll keep reading, you'll find that Philip was having a good time. And God said, I got me a good man there. I got a job for him, and he sent him down to hitch up with an Ethiopian eunuch going back to Egypt, the servant of Candice, the queen. God said, I, the uttermost parts of the earth. It ain't changed. God still, the gospel still works. Can you tell me something more important tonight than the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you tell me something we ought to be living our lives more for? While the world is worried about Hollywood and the Kardashians and whatever else, you know, and all that nonsense, and they're making much ado out of nothing, you and I that are saved are sitting around wondering, is it over yet? Are we done yet? Time up. You know what you call a guy on a team that looks at the clock? A loser. You're supposed to play into the final whistle. I wouldn't have a guy on my team that stood up there and said, oh, look at that. We're in the fourth quarter. We may as well quit now. Play into the final whistle. And guess what? We win. But pray tell me why 
My whole lifetime have I seen the majority of Christians as if we're, we're losing. God can't do it. We just have to give up. It's all, I don't understand. Dear Heavenly Father, help us tonight. God, little is much when God is in it. Lord, I know I'm just a little fellow from Trace Creek, but your word is real to me. And God, I want it to be real to others. And I believe these folks here tonight, the Lord God can testify of the same thing. Nobody here tonight, Lord, thinks that we're anything great, but we believe you're a great God. And Lord, we believe tonight that it could be as it once was. And God, we could see revival. God, we can see people saved. We can occupy till you come. Help us tonight, Lord, in this prayer service to have a burden from heaven to magnify the Lord like never before. Help us, we pray. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Would you stand tonight? Maybe you'd like to find somewhere and pray and just say, God, help me. God, use me to glorify your name. Help me to play to the final whistle. God, help me to just keep on keeping on until Jesus comes. If you need to find somewhere tonight, pray. Don't, don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your community. Don't give up on your church. Don't give up on your nation. Find somewhere tonight to pray and say, God, I believe you're a great God. And I believe you can do great things.